Okay, well, why don't we get started? So I wanna thank everyone for joining us for Parent Perks with Dr. Joanna Genge. Talking about sex and sexuality can be difficult. However, research indicates that having these conversations early and often contributes to various positive outcomes. Today's talk will help get the conversation started by blending evidence-based findings with practical advice, as well as the sharing of developmentally appropriate resources. Dr. Joanna Gench is the Director of Student Programming and Community Engagement in the School of Behavioral and Brain Sciences at the University of Texas at Dallas. She is a developmental psychologist and received both her PhD and master's degree from UTD Dallas. So we want to welcome you. Thank you for being here with us. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm, you can you all hear me? Okay, Jill, thumbs up. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, I'm, I'm, Really happy to be here. I was supposed to be with you all last spring, and obviously things, you know, sort of changed, and, and I wasn't able to come in person. But I'm excited to be here today, and certainly this is a conversation that for some people may be more comfortable virtually. Um, I, I've had students share with me that they like the online format for talking about these things because they don't have to be in a, a room with 150 other people when when we we bring up certain topics. Um, as, as Jill said, I, I want to talk about sort of how we address these issues and how we can really be askable parents. Um, I'm, I'm going to give you a little context of, of where I'm from with, with this topic. We know every child's different and there's no right way to talk about sex with your child. You really just have to know what your child's um, needs and concerns are. But I do wanna share just basic evidence-based data and information, and I hope this is gonna help, um, help you become and hopefully remain really a credible and influential source about sexuality in your children's lives. Um, as I said, my background, I'm a developmental psychologist, and I don't think I need to go into too much detail today about the benefits of what we know about good, comprehensive, and inclusive sex education. There's a lot of documentation about that. In fact, Dallas is now, the, the Dallas Public School District is now adopting a more comprehensive sex education program uh, since there's so much good evidence out there. And because it's documented and because you're here today, that tells me a lot about what's important to you as parents. Um, before we begin with the sort of the scientific details and all the evidence-based information, I want to give you a little context about my background. As Jill shared in the introduction, I'm a developmental psychologist. I'm also a professor. I've been studying and writing and learning about these topics for, for nearly two decades. And in addition to my professional credentials, I'm also a mom. I had two daughters. Um, who are now in their, their early 30s, and I'm also a grandmother of two. Uh, my kids went to Green Hill School from preschool all the way through high school, and so I had a lot of, of, of um, friends whose kids went to Lamplighter and then merged into Green Hill. So I have a, a, a good sense of, of your curriculum and, you know, the, the structure of, of independent education um, in your school. So I know, again, I know sort of the ideology is, is shared as well. For more than a decade, I was the project manager for a research project that studied social aggression. And in third grade, we recruited over 300 families in the Dallas area. And when the participants were in third grade, they started coming in with friends and their parents. And we followed these, this, these families all the way through their entry to college. We called the study the Blackberry Project because we distributed Blackberries. And for you guys who are too young to know what those are, those are obviously early iPhones, right? Um, we distributed Blackberries to the participants in ninth grade because we were increasingly aware that this is how, how young people were interacting. And what we did with their and their family's permission is that for the four years that they were in high school, we archived all of their text messages. Now, I can't see your, your faces necessarily, but when I tell people that, I, th th their faces look somewhat overwhelmed and boggled because all of a sudden they realize that we have this, this um, window into adolescents' social lives, into their personal lives, because as you know, 
with texting, there is a lot of information being shared, a lot of um, communication being shared. So for that four years, I helped develop a coding system where we, we looked at different time periods and different, different selected days to see what kids were talking about and how they were talking about certain topics. And as a result, I saw a lot of information and a lot of discussion in high school about sexual topics. And I was also somewhat overwhelmed with the misinformation that was being shared among peers. Um, of course, I couldn't reach into the phones and, and tell them what, what was correct information. Um, we were bound by confidentiality and we had de-identified these, these participants. And so we didn't know specifically who they were, um, but it was, it was fairly um, eye-opening as a parent to, to really see what, what kids were talking about. In addition to that, since, since 2003, the same year I started that study, I've been teaching human sexuality. And through the years, I've had over 4,000 students take that class. And again, it's an upper level elective at UT Dallas. And so I have students from all different areas, all different majors who, um, again, share with, with each other and with me throughout the, the, the process of, of this class that they just didn't know a lot about these issues. A lot of them were um, involved in abstinence-only education programs, and, and a lot of times they, they shared that they never once talked to their parents about these topics. So it became really clear to me that, that this was important. And as parents, I knew that parents wanted to know how to do this and how to do it um, in a way that felt comfortable to them. So what I don't want to do today is I don't want to tell you how to think about things. I don't want to um, try to change your perspective or worldview or, or share my values in any significant way. Uh, but what I do want to do is take what, what's known as a sex positive approach to this discussion. And I don't want that to be confused with the idea that sex positivity is implying sort of an anything goes worldview. Uh, because it isn't. Um, there's, there's important information that needs to be shared about safety, um, about, good, uh, about good healthy decisions and that kind of thing. So I'll, I'll, I'll get into a little bit more about what that means as we talk about the specifics. So as I said, you know, I don't want to in any way imply that education is permission or encouragement for kids to be involved in sexual activity or sexual behavior that is not good for them, that's not healthy for them, um, that could create um, other kinds of distress. But that being said, it's really important for them to truly understand what the world is like for them and for you all to have a, have a sense of what kinds of challenges they're facing as well. So regardless of how your family's arranged, we know that all parents and all children are going to encounter different kinds of relationship diversity, different kinds of gender diversity, um, different kinds of sexual relationships throughout their lives. So when we talk about sex with our kids, we talk about so much more than sexual activity. As parents, that is sort of, I think the first thing that comes to mind is how can we keep them safe? How can we delay sexual initiation, right? But in addition to that, we're going to be facing and, and talking about throughout their life, things like their bodies, um, consent, early sexualization, emotional and romantic feelings, gender, LGBTQ plus topics, you know, sexual orientation, origins of that, understanding that. Um, a big challenge and, and something you're probably talking about a lot amongst yourselves and as parents is, is exposure to pornography, um, how to help kids with media and digital literacy, uh, what's going on with them with puberty, um, what, what, do we talk, what do we tell them about masturbation or do we even discuss that, um, and, and, and so on. Uh, relationships, reproduction, there's just so many different topics. And, and we're not going to obviously have time to get into the specifics of each of those. But again, teaching your children that the burner on the stove can be hot doesn't make them necessarily want to touch it. 
So, so having conversations with these with, with your kids about all these various topics doesn't necessarily imply. In fact, research shows that, that kids who have more information are actually more likely to delay um, sexual initiation. So we have to kind of step back when we're, when we're starting to address some of these issues and know that even though a lot of what we know about human sexuality is stable, there's always going to be new research and there's always ever-changing social contexts. So we need to revisit what we know and what we've learned. So for example, when I started teaching this class in 2003, gay marriage was not legal in Texas. In fact, there were sodomy laws on the books still. That was the year that the, the Supreme Court um, overturned the sodomy laws. That was uh, Texas. It was a Texas uh, case that was brought to the Supreme Court. So there were a lot of different discussions in my class about those topics in 2003. Um, in 2015, of course, you know, gay marriage was, was um, uh, systematically um, made legal across the country due to, due to the Supreme Court decision then. So there's always changing context and changing attitudes and changing beliefs. So we have to step back and think about our own lens. And I, I have students do this activity um, as sort of a self-reflection when they're in my class. And I have them think about all the different socializing agents and all the different ways that they learned about these topics. And it helps for us to sort of untangle our own narrative about what we learned and how we learned it. Your story, of course, is a combination of all your experiences and your fears and your memories, both good and bad. Um, and you bring this to the discussion when your child asks you questions or when you're concerned about something. So the goal when you have you know, access to this sort of information and the tools that you need is to sort of ultimately think about how you can pass on your support and your wisdom and your experience instead of passing on fear and perhaps any kind of trauma or shame, right? So there's, there's, there's a variety of goals we have, but that's sort of the ultimate one. The thing that I get asked the most, the question I get asked the most is, well, when do we start talking about these things? And how, you know, at what age do we introduce certain topics? So we can't necessarily answer that definitively, because as I said, you know, all kids are different. And we know that children mature in a dynamic way. It's not a sort of one-time achievement. And development occurs on a continuum instead of in discrete stages, as, as some of us may have first heard in, in child development, right? So because of this, and when it comes to talking about developing healthy sexual attitudes and, and healthy sexual sense of self, I want to encourage you, as challenging as it is and as difficult as it is, to, as much as possible, communicate in the now. So what that means is every time a question comes up or there's, there appears to be some sort of interest in a particular topic, address it as quickly as you can. Now, oftentimes when kids ask questions that, that are deemed as, as about things that are deemed as too mature, parents will say, well, we'll talk about that when you're older, or that's an adult thing. But if you dig in a little bit and you, you kind of get at the why of why, why they're asking something and you ask them questions, oh, that's an interesting question. Why do, you, why do you think about that? Or what do you think about that? What you quickly find out is that they don't really need to know all the specifics. They just need to know how you feel about something in that moment. And you all may have had experiences about this. So if, if a child asks you, you know, where do babies come from? You don't need to get into the whole story of reproduction with that first question. Developmentally, you can assess where your child is at and sort of how much information do they need to know in that moment. And they're usually pretty satisfied with brief and simple explanations. If you're in the park and your child is playing and there's two, two same-sex people sitting on a park bench and they start kissing and your child says, mommy, why are those two men kissing each other? You don't have to go into a long explanation about you know, the origins of sexual orientation. 
what you can just say is, well, I suppose it's because they love each other. That's, that's usually why people kiss or they, they care about each other, right? But again, you can, you can preface that with, oh, that's interesting. Why do you, you know, why do you think that's different? You don't ask, you know, or do you, do you point that out when, when two people who are of, of um, the opposite sex are kissing? So again, this is something that if you introduce the, the information gradually and you integrate it with their natural, their natural curiosity as it comes up, it becomes much easier to always be addressing these topics in a very sort of simple way. You know, again, stick to the facts. If, if a child asks why a, how a plane flies, you're not gonna get into all the aerodynamics and the physics explanation when they're young. You're going to simply address it as easily as you can. And the more you do that, the easier it's gonna be for you and the easier it's going to be for your child to ask questions and, and think of you as someone who's an askable parent, right? If you keep it casual um, and you're mindful of how you respond, we all know our kids respond to our facial expressions, to our body language, to our moods. Um, I can tell you that the first time I have a recollection of asking my parents a question about sex or anything related to that was when I was about six years old. And I have a vivid memory of this and it'll become clear to you why I have a vivid memory. Um, I, we had a lake house and at the lake house, there was a little boat house on the water and our, our the regular part of the house was, was away from that. So the little boat house was sort of open for people to come and go. It was just a little screened in area. And as a result of that, there would be times where teenagers would, would visit that little boathouse and get into shenanigans, including you know, underage drinking and, as you can um, imagine, other kinds of things. So we would find beer cans in there occasionally. And it would be you know, cigarette butts, and we'd know that, that people had been there. Um, but we also, at one point, I went down there, like I said, I was six or seven years old, and I, I found this, this thing on the ground that I had never seen before. I brought it up, up to, the, to the main part of the house. I walked in, my dad was sitting at his desk working that summer and I held it up and I said, look what I found. And it was a used condom. And <laughs> so Jill's expression, I was, I was met with the most horrified, dramatic, you know, it, you know my, my father yelled and screamed, drop that, oh, did, you know, and, and later I said, well, what is it? And he's like, you know, you're too young. We'll talk about this later. I'll tell you all this later. So again, he, he in the moment, he was so shocked and horrified that, that my memory is so embedded with that vivid um, expression of disgust and being told that this is not something we, we address now. Now, my parents were, were, were usually very askable parents, but I think in that moment, um, it, was, it was overwhelming for him and he didn't know how to manage it. And we didn't talk about it again. And I don't remember it ever coming up again, or at least as far as my recollection goes. So try to be mindful if, if there's something, if you, if you encounter your child doing something that you find horrifying, or if you see them watching something that, that terrifies you, try to be calm and mindful of how that, that mood, that expression, that can be embedded and become a very vivid um, uh, concern for the child that, that what they're doing is somehow terrible and shameful. And, and, you know, again, that can be, be part of how they start developing sort of a representation of how to manage this. Um, you know, look for teachable moments. You, you hear this about a lot of, of parenting ideas, whether it's about underage drinking or, or sexuality, look for times where you can, if they're not asking questions, um, where you can introduce conversation. And there's a lot of opportunities for this. If you, if you choose to, again, try to address things in a developmentally appropriate way. Now, at the end of the, of the presentation, I'll give you some resources for, um, for good books, for example, that tell you sort of age by, by stage what developmentally appropriate looks like. Um, I can just sort of sum it up in a, in a kind of a broad way right now, basically by saying developmentally appropriate is sort of where the child is at. 
um, and, and you have a good sense of where your child's at in a lot of, a lot of topics. It's also important to use accurate language um, and not just for body parts. And so, for example, I had a phone call from one of my, my lifelong friends. She's my age, I'm 60 this year. And she has gone back to work. She hasn't worked in many, many years. And she's gone back to work with, in, with four-year-olds in preschool. And she called me and she said, Joanna, I have been going through this training and I now have to, when, when kids are going to the bathroom, I have to say, did you wipe your vagina? <laughs> Did you make sure you wiped from front to back? And she said, I can't use the V word. And I said, well, what word would you like to use? You know, and she said, well, I just, you know, I, I'm not comfortable with using that with four-year-olds. And so I had a whole conversation with her about why it's important early on to use the appropriate language. And, and I'm sure that, that I, I just have a really good sense that at Lamplighter, you guys are using, at, at the early years, you guys are using the correct terms. Now, this applies even more. Um, obviously, body parts are, are part of our bodies, and so it's easier to sort of um, talk about them in that way. Um, it's important. There, there's studies that show that, that, that have been done with incarcerated sex offenders that have noted that they actually avoid interacting with kids who know the appropriate words for their, their body parts. They recognize that kids are more vulnerable when they don't know how to empower themselves with that kind of information. And so there's, there's all sorts of evidence that shows that that's important for safety. Um, and it'll become even more important as part of this sort of ongoing um, body positivity as well as, as for other reasons. The other information about using accurate language is that there's a lot of confusion about what people mean when they talk about sex. And so, you know, I know that my daughter at one point came home, she was, I want she was in lower school, so it had to have been in first or second grade. And she told me that two of her friends were having sex on the playground. And I said, really? What makes you say that? Well, because they were, they were hugging and they were kissing. So again, that was an opportunity for me to say, well, you know, this is what you think this means. What does this really mean? And again, we didn't get into what intercourse is all about at that point, but I just clarified that, that hugging and kissing was not having sex, right? Um, we see this also when adolescents are starting to communicate in different ways about different kinds of activities, and they will share information about hooking up, for example. And hooking up means a whole variety of things, from meeting somewhere all the way to having sex. And so having a clarity and a shared vocabulary early on, even if it's not where they need to be developmentally, um, is useful as well. The other thing is that for so long, we as parents were, were sort of focused on teaching our children about their own bodies, but we didn't necessarily teach children about the other genders or the other sex's body, right? Um, we, need to, we need kids to be aware of, of the different body parts, um, not just with the bodies they inhabit. And that's, a, again, a discussion that you can have in, in a variety of different contexts and it can come up naturally and it's important to not shy away from that as well. <clears throat> now, I, I mentioned safety concerns, and one of the, um, the safety concerns that often comes up is about boundaries and personal space. Um, it's, 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 it's often recommended that you use sort of a bubble metaphor to talk about, you know, here's, here, this is my, my bubble, right? Um, and this is true of not just any kind of touching that somebody might do of your child, but also just in general, this idea about boundaries that can be replicated and carried through all relationships. So for example, um, people do tickling games, right? And that is, that's not touch that's always welcomed. So, you know, before you tickle a child or before you encourage a child to tickle each other, you want to talk about consent and boundaries. 
um, not in an adult way, but in a very simplistic way based on their developmental age as well. Now there's a lot here and I wanna get into, I wanna get into um, parenting topics, you know, and what we know about that. So I just wanna say a few things and, and, and point out a couple of things on this slide. Um, there's a lot of concerns and, and at one point I was a pediatric therapist before I was a professor and I worked with special needs kids and their parents. And there was a lot of concern about what is typical behavior and when to be concerned. And there's, um, there's actually a, a, a developmental checklist. It's the, the child sexual behavior inventory that can be given by a professional to assess if there's anything that is atypical. Uh, because usually behavior is not a matter of um, kind. Atypical behavior is not a difference in kind. It's more a difference in degree because at some point kids will usually engage in, in all sorts of behavior. It's just how much and how intense and, and who they're doing it with. So in that checklist, that's, that's based on a referral to a professional who would look at things like boundary issues that were consistent, exhibition, exhibitionism, um, self-stimulation behaviors that are above, you know, out of the norm in terms of where it occurs and, and the frequency, um, you know, sort of uh, sexual interest that doesn't seem typical, uh, voyeuristic behavior and, and sexual knowledge that is probably out of the realm of um, appropriate age as well. So <clears throat> that is if, if there are obvious concerns that a child's been exposed to something, these things might occur frequently or, in, or with intensity. And that's when a referral to a professional is warranted. Otherwise, you know, exploration with same-sex peers, um, self-stimulation behaviors, you know, that's the M word, right? Masturbation, um, that's pretty normal. And it, the, the messages that we give to kids should be, you know, this is, this is okay that you, what you do is okay. Just, you know, we, we do these things privately. Um, and in terms of exploring with peers, of course, that is normative as well, as long as those boundaries are being respected. And that's just, again, an ongoing conversation about boundaries. When kids get into a um, little bit older ages, right, we want to continue to avoid euphemisms, to continue to use appropriate language. Uh, we want to continue to bust myths and dispel playground theories that they might have. Again, I had, I had um, kids who were texting each other in high school, sharing all sorts of nugget of wisdom, you know, saying, it's okay if you have sex in a hot tub because you can't get pregnant underwater. Um, if you have sex and it's unprotected, you can just use Mountain Dew and that will, that will take care of, um, that will kill sperm you know, all sorts of, of um, information that's being shared. So any chance that you have to sort of um, minimize those, those myths, that's a great opportunity to do that. This is the time early on. Now I said to before to communicate in the now. Um, in this case, it's, it's important to not just communicate in the now, but sort of anticipate what's coming uh, because there's a, a wide range of development that's occurring at this age. And we see early signs of puberty, um, sometimes as early as nine and 10, is when we start seeing um, the more, the, the, the secondary sex characteristics develop as well. At this age, it's really important to really be focused on health and, and all the issues related to health and less focused on appearance-based messaging um, this is a challenge because kids are becoming a lot more aware of the importance of appearance and, and the status linked to appearance. It's also um, a time where, again, there, there's interventions that can, that can take place that can be um, long lasting. This is when the CDC recommends the HPV vaccine between the age of 11 and 12 as well. So that's a teachable moment to discuss that kind of issue. Um, and, and what you're protecting your child from and why it's important to you <clears throat> to protect your child. 
All right. The other thing that's happening, and and I this is this is sort of a pubertal um, discussion is that um, there's these individual differences in pubertal timing that can have all sorts of differential outcomes um, in a trajectory of a child. So this varies by gender. And I do a lot of school talks um, with teachers and even middle school teachers, are, you know, even though they sort of intellectualize this, they're, they're sort of not aware of, of what the outcomes look like and the social, emotional, and psychological aspects um, related to pubertal differences. So for females who develop earlier than their peers, so for females who are early developing um, in terms of puberty, earlier than their peers, there are risky outcomes for them. And there's a lot of evidence about that. And so again, to, to be aware of what those potential risks are, kids get sexualized earlier, um, they, they get noticed by older peers, they get introduced to um, behaviors earlier because they start affiliating sometimes with those older peers. There's a lot of peer aggression that goes along when girls are, um, are developing earlier than their friends. Uh, so there's, there's negative social emotional aspects for early developing girls. The good news is, is that the later, the late bloomers for girls, there's actually good positive outcomes for them because there's not as much social and um, pressures and there's not as much focus on appearance. They tend to um, engage more heavily in academics and other kinds of activities. And so it's a real kind of buffering safe space for them to be in. And they tend to um, affiliate with their same sex peers who are also late bloomers. And so girls have the support of their friends. Now it's the opposite for boys though. For boys, early developing boys actually have social um, prestige. They get deeper voices, they, they get more muscle. Um, oftentimes that's correlated with success in athletics. And so for them, they have actually positive social, psychosocial outcomes for being early developers. Whereas for the early developing girls, it's, it's not so positive. Um, they get bullied less, right? In fact, they don't get bullied at all, um, the, the early developing boys. For late developing boys, the, they don't have the same positive outcomes for late developing girls, right? They tend to be, and again, this is, this is those that are outside of the norm. This isn't the, the kind of the, the overall peer group. Um, they often are the ones who get bullied. They're often the ones who get left behind. Um, and they don't necessarily affiliate with their friends, they socially withdraw. And a lot of times they, they get more involved in, in sort of solitary activities, um, gaming, uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of school withdrawal that occurs there. So again, it's, it's really hard to tell you where to address concerns with your child um, across the spectrum because you have to be really aware of where your child is fitting into this emerging and changing social scene that's happening um, in that very early prepubertal time all the way through the, the expanded pubertal years, right? Um, the other thing that's happening at this age is the social emotional aspect of of developing real romantic interests. And if you go back to and think about your story and your first crush, um, and again, this is based on, on lots and lots of research of, of retrospective reports, most people will say it's around fourth or fifth grade that they started being aware of romantic interests. So with those first romantic interests, with those first sort of crushes that develop, there's also a great risk of rejection um, and, and feeling um, heartbroken. And there's a lot of, a lot of crises um, surrounding that as well. Uh, there's been a lot of concern over the last decade with developmental psychologists looking at how um, relationships or intimate relationships are changing. We're seeing less and less um, sort of dating relationships and more casual relationships. And parents sometimes think that's great 
and, and will say, well, I'm, I'm really relieved that my child isn't, you know, developing some sort of intense romantic connection to someone else because that's going to protect them from um, engaging in sexual behavior. And that's not the case. Those two things are often divorced. So, so you know, kids are still engaging in sexual behavior. Um, they just aren't necessarily doing it in a committed monogamous fashion like they, they did you know, when we were, when we, you guys are a lot younger than me, uh, but, but even when you all were um, um, in your youth, right? So we don't really know because we don't have enough data yet to sort of see what the outcomes are of that, but we're seeing more and more um, early 20s college students reporting that they just don't feel like they sort of had the practice to develop intimacy that, that they would like. Um, and so that's something to be aware of. Not that you necessarily need to encourage um, your child to date, but when they're not, there's there's something that's that's changing in those dynamics as well. Um, all right. I wanted to talk about parenting and, and there's a lot to say about this. In general, par parenting is, um, all the good parenting strategies apply when it comes to sexuality. And I'm gonna jump into this slide and there's a lot on here and, and I will provide these for you um, to dig in too deeper um, when we're done. I just wanna say that, that on the left-hand side, the bulleted list, there is a, um, a list of parenting um, behaviors and characteristics that have been linked through research to good, healthy sexual outcomes for kids. I wanna also say that what happens in, in um, middle, middle childhood and pre-pubertal years is that parents who are very, very engaged and very involved in their kids' lives, when their kids start um, pushing them away, um, and that's part of this quest for autonomy that the kids do, a lot of times parents get their feelings hurt and they sort of allow themselves to be pushed away. And the other thing that happens is that parents don't wanna know about their child as sexual beings. So they, this is when they start sort of saying, I don't really wanna know, right? And I, and I had parents say, when my kids were, were growing up, I remember parents saying to me, I don't wanna know what they're doing. Like, it's just, it's just like, I just wanna pretend like it's not happening. And this is where, as a parent, we just really have to know what they're doing. So there's a lot on here, but I want to point out the most important thing that is linked to healthy sexual outcomes for kids is parental monitoring. Um, that is probably, you know, all the things like style, that's good parenting. Support is good parenting. Um, control, I'll, I'll, have, I'll mention that real quick. Um, monitoring, it is knowing what your kids are doing. It's not necessarily spying on your kids um, because again, that's what parents assume when I say monitoring. They're like, well, does that mean I have to spy on what they're doing? Does that mean I have to read you know, their diaries and, and you know, snoop on their phones and do all that kind of thing? And I say, it's not spying, um, it's, it's monitoring. And monitoring is knowing where your kids are, knowing in general, who their friends are, what who the parents are of their friends, what sort of the general rules are around um, access to all sorts of things. That is the, the single most important thing that's linked to lower odds of unwanted sexual activity. And it helps kids delay sexual interactions that they're not ready for, okay? If they're aware that their parents are monitoring, it gives them a sense of security, even though they might act like they resent it. it, it they, they like to know that you're doing everything you can to keep them safe. And we can talk about specifics of monitoring when we do questions, which I'm gonna get to in just a minute. Um, I mentioned control. There's a difference between psychological control and behavioral control. Um, psychological control is, is not a healthy way to, to interact with kids. The list of, of things that parents do that, that is involved with psychological control are guilt induction, love withdrawal, that can be the silent treatment if they disappoint you, that kind of thing. 
um, invalidating their feelings, constraining their verbal expressions. That's not allowing them to talk um, and you telling them what they should be saying or thinking. And then of course, a personal attack. Behavioral control is actually really healthy. Behavioral control includes setting boundaries, um, having curfews, having rules that are, again, separated from the emotion of it, um, having expectations and that kind of thing, right? All right, um, I'm gonna not get into this list. I'm gonna, I wanna give you guys time for questions and we can come back to this. Um, we are in a different world, obviously, <clears throat> with technology and understanding, kids need to understand what <clears throat> your boundaries are in terms of, um, digital devices in terms of um, pornography um, and, and so on and so forth. There's been a lot of, of um, discussion about this. The New York Times has been doing some great articles about teaching pornography literacy to kids, um, and I can share those links as well. All right, let's see. Is it, what time is it? It's, it's um, time, I think, to pause for questions. Like I said, I've, at the end here, I've got these resources, which um, are some of my favorite. These are links over here for this information, but then there's also these great books that, that are really appropriate at different ages. So Jill, let's go ahead and open it up for questions um, at this point. And I can go back and, and revisit certain points. Feel free to type any questions in that chat box or even unmute and just ask them pretty casual. Yeah. I'm trying to see the text box. I'm not sure if I can see it. It's it's down on the bottom, it says chat. You're a Teams girl, right? I am. I'm like, where and and I and I and I do zoom, but I don't um all right, I don't, I don't see So that. I see one, it says, can I get a recording of today's presentation? So yes, so Dr. Gensch is recording that and um, it will be updated on the parent portal. I'm also happy to provide the slides as well um, so that you don't have to listen to me drone on the whole time if you just wanna look at the, the different pointers there. Jill, if you don't mind, will you read the questions? Just yes, I, don't want to... I will feed you the questions. So yes, okay. we would love to have the slides as well that we could put on the portal. That would be okay. great. So here's a question. If you have a female child who is an early developer, are there any specific things to help mitigate the negative posi possible effects? <clears throat> so this, not only do I know this research, but I also had two daughters. One of them was an early developer. And... There were signs that not just pubertally, but she was just, she was one of those kids who was really tall for her age. Um, she looked a lot older and we would go places when she was, you know, three, four or five years old and people would assume she was seven or eight just by her appearance. Um, again, she went to Green Hill School and this is what happens in, um, in a lot of schools, but I think it was even more of an issue at Green Hill, and I don't mean that in a negative way, although there was some negative context. When the kids move into upper school, and actually even when they're in the, in the middle school, there's a lot of interaction between the grades and the ages. So when she was in eighth grade, she was playing sports and interacting with a lot of the high school kids. Um, she actually developed a romantic relationship with someone who was two years older than her. Uh, and, and there was a lot of um, peer aggression around that, not just from the people in her own peer group who, you know, there was sort of this resentment, um, but there was also um, some real sort of harassment about it. Uh, and, and I took it to the school. The school at the time really did a good job of addressing it. At the time, there wasn't um, anything in the handbook about there was, there was, sorry, there was sexual harassment statements in the handbook, um, but things like name calling because there was, you know, labeling that was going on um, and, and a lot of that was happening. So I just had to stay calm, be supportive. And like I said, the most important thing I could do at the time 
is that since she was developing this romantic relationship with someone who was, um, she, they, they became friends when she was in eighth grade and he was in 10th grade. He was actually a really good kid. And again, through parental monitoring, I grew to know that. <laughs> but I didn't know it when, when he first started showing an interest. Um, so I just insisted that they hang out at the house, that there be all sorts of sort of expectations about what they could and couldn't do. Um, for example, by the time she got to upper school, he was driving and I wouldn't let her go in a car with him. Um, he could be at the house, they could, you know, do certain things together, but there was just a lot of monitoring that took place. The most support I needed to give her, and, and I would say for early developing girls in general, is that um, as much as it feels good to get this attention, because it, it does increase, there were certain kinds of aspects of popularity that, that increased because of that. It's um, the attention is about appearance. The attention is not about who they are. So it's just a lot of discussion about that. And again, a lot of sort of trying to um, prevent the negative kinds of activities that can occur. Um, so I was lucky. And again, this was an advantage for the school she was at. She was very involved in athletics. And so I was lucky that that was an emphasis that she could focus on her, um, her athletics. And that was something that sort of took her out of this other realm that there was a lot of attention being placed on that. Uh, and so just know your kid and be supportive um, and understand that it's not just, um, that there's these, there's sort of these mixed things that are going on. It feels really good to get attention um, for being attractive. It feels really good to get attention from older kids. That makes you feel really mature, but sort of step back and, and talk about what that is and what that looks like. Thank Hope you. Yeah. So our next question, can you talk about a parenting approach to pornography, probably from an upper, upper elementary boy perspective? Okay, so I, I get this a lot. And yes, kids are getting, getting access to and exposure to pornography really early. Um, and oftentimes this is their first exposure to anything sexual. And, and the problem is, is that this, the pornography that they see um, is not a good representation of what healthy sexuality looks like, right? It, it can often be very graphic and violent. Um, I would continue to have the discussion. Again, the monitoring piece is sort of knowing what they're seeing, where they're seeing it, um, talking to them about what they're seeing. I will Along with um, these slides, there's a great, um, in the APA monitor, which is the most recent publication, there's actually a, um, a paper that was done on, on recent research called Teaching Porn Literacy. I can share that as well um, because it's not gonna be published in, in general population. There was, um, like I said, in the New York Times, there was an article as well. And, and, and a lot of it just has to do with discussing with your, child what they're seeing and how it doesn't really reflect um, real life. One of the um, one of the sex ed teachers who talks about pornography with with kids will show a clip of the Fast and the Furious and they'll they'll afterwards they'll say, you know, does this really look like how people drive cars? And what are the consequences of how they drove the car? So they use it in sort of a metaphorical way. I just watched, I'm, I'm watching a show right now um, called Ginny in Virginia. I think, no, I'm sorry, Ginny in Georgia. It's on Netflix. There's a lot of content on there that, that's useful to sort of watch and perhaps, depending on your child's age, share with your child. Uh, because it's all about a 16-year-old and the, the experiences. And there's a whole um, incident where a bunch of girls are watching pornography together. And what I liked about it, even though it's pretty adult topics, is that they were, they were talking to each other about, like, does that even work like that? And, oh, boy, that doesn't look like that's a lot of fun, right? Um, I'm not sure how much girls are doing that at this age. You know, certainly they're having more exposure to it. With young boys, 
it can be fairly traumatic. Um, and so to, to see this and, and for young girls too. So I think sort of reassuring them that some of what they're seeing isn't real, that that's not really what people look like, that that's not really what necessarily it should look like. Um, and just having, having a, a regular conversation about it. And again, sort of um, ha allowing them to ask you questions. And I know it's awkward. I used to always talk to my kids when we were driving because they were behind me and, you know, in, in the back and we wouldn't make eye contact and they were sort of trapped, right? Um, and, and the other way that that was useful is that when they had their friends in the car, I could overhear discussions and I wouldn't intervene at the moment, but after their friends would get out of the car, I'd have the opportunity to be like, oh, so I noticed you guys were talking about this. And she, they'd, they'd be like, I can't believe you were listening, mom. And it's like, well, but you knew I was there. <laughs> um, so sometimes kids want you to hear them. And again, that's part of the, the monitoring too. It allows them to feel safe there too. So with pornography, I'll, I'll share those, those resources, um, but just lots of ongoing discussions about, about the risks um, of, of thinking that that's what real life is like and that's what real intimacy looks like because it, it doesn't look like that. Thank you. So we have about five more minutes and we have three more questions. So I'm okay. going to feed you the first one. What is the best way to handle a situation when kids are curious and explore nudity and sexuality with friends? So this is, you know, this goes back to, again, kids are naturally very curious and they're curious about other people's bodies. If you go back to pretend play um, with early childhood, you know, kids do a lot of pretend play. They play doctor, um, they play house, and you'll see them, you know, modeling and imitating the things they see at home. So, it's very normal for kids to want to see each other's naked bodies. This will peak in, in sort of preschool years because they're gonna start getting and incorporating the messages that that should not be done in, in you know, overtly. They get the message that it should be done more covertly. Now around five, kids start getting much more modest and private, and you'll you'll probably see that as well. And again, they're they're sort of internalizing messages about people's bodies and and what's you know appropriate and what's not appropriate. And this is why you keep having that boundary conversation. You know, if you're using the restroom and your child's coming and you say, "I need my privacy right now," so if kids are exploring sort of in the you know the the seven to twelve year old range. Um, with peers, it's normal. It's just that if it is in some way, um, if there's some indication that there's concern, if a child seems distressed, that maybe boundaries were, um, were um, crossed, right? If a friend did something inappropriate, that's sort of the opportunity to kind of gauge, you know, where are you at? What's, how are you feeling about this? Um, Kids need to also, again, going back to monitoring, they need to be allowed to have some independence and autonomy, but, but they also need to be sort of checked in on fairly regularly. Um, and so there would be expectations then like, okay, that, that things wouldn't necessarily get to too complex a, a situation. Um, knowing, you know, who's at home, how much monitoring there is, and that kind of stuff helps a lot. And again, that helps kids understand and feel safe that they know that something, a game that they're playing isn't going to go too far. But playing those little games is also normal. And so if you if you stumble upon that, if you walk in on that, it's best not to freak out and, and be shocked and horrified and be like, your friend needs to go home immediately. This is not appropriate. It's better to just calmly you know, redirect, um, address it, not necessarily with both of them in the, in the moment. If it's something that's really concerning, um, then, and, and when I say really concerning, if there's something, um, if there's objects being used inappropriately, if there's anything like that that's happening, um, then that's a conversation to have with the other child's parents too, for them to have that same 
Um, and again, to, to take out the shame and the guilt in that conversation, but just to say, you know, I know kids explore and I know they're good friends, um, but we need to be on the same page about what our boundaries are, what our um, concerns are as well. And again, the, the sex positivity part of it is, you know, um, these things are, are appropriate when you get older to do and to try, but right now it's, you know, it's not, it's not, you're not ready for those things. And so it, it, it's hard to kind of come up with a specific example because there's so many ranges of behaviors, but same sex, when you think about the fact that, that kids are, we call this homo social play, kids are, are, are in gender, same gender groups. And so a lot of their exploration is gonna be done in same sex groups. And that doesn't imply that there's an emerging sexual orientation. That doesn't mean it won't emerge later. Um, but it's not a it's not a clue or a precursor. Kids practice with their friends, all sorts of things. Okay. Thank you for that. That was a great question and a great answer. They're any, all great questions. Yeah. Yes, it's true. Um, any tips for talking with a child who doesn't want to talk? And this would be an upper elementary boy, perhaps that might oh. want to share. So what's interesting is that the talk shouldn't, again, the talk should never be just the talk. It should be this ongoing discussion. And so, yeah, boys are, are often more resistant than girls are. Girls like to talk about things like romance and love and you know the Disney stuff introduces them very early boys especially you know early elementary all the way through middle you know they're a little bit less focused on those topics and and they find them more uncomfortable what's interesting is that we sort of assign those discussions by gender so you know it's usually up to the father to talk to the boy about it um I did a study and we found that moms who have just strong supportive relationships with their boys um, actually end up with boys who have better attitudes towards women. Um, and so it doesn't have to be about, you know, sex or pornography. It can just be just general sort of attitudinal things. And the way to talk about it is not to talk at them, but to talk with them and to ask a lot of questions. And if they don't, respond, you don't have to push it too. And again, you use times where it's after you've watched a movie and something you can, you know, be like, what did you think about that? Or how did you feel about how that boy treated that girl? Um, as opposed to you saying to them, you know, I don't like the way that boy treated that girl, right? Because you're telling them how to think about something. And that often shuts kids down because it feels luxury. So just that those, those, I'm going to go back, those, those sort of um, general, I don't know how to go back on this. <laughs> Again, it's, I'm a team's person. Um, the general kinds of, of um, style, uh, you know, be supportive, be friendly, um, and just ask a lot of questions and, and just do that about a lot of topics, because if it's specially focused on sex, then that's when they're going to kind of shut down. And, and one more thing to add, and I know we're running out of time, but always use it as an opportunity to talk about your values as a family too. Um, to, you can, again, you can use those questions to get at what your values are. So if you ask a question about how did you feel about how that boy, you know, treated that girl when he took that text message, you know, or he, he sent out that text message or whatever to all his friends, what did you think about that? And then bring it back to just kind of basic values of, of compassion and empathy and, um, you know, sharing people's secrets. And, and you can also use that reiterate, like, you know, it's okay to have secrets, but a lot of secrets can hurt people. So there are certain secrets that are not appropriate and that kind of thing. Um, so again, I know that, that that doesn't specifically answer your question, but just know that that talk should not be delayed for dad to do it um, when puberty hits, where it's like, okay, so we're going to sit down. I'm going to tell you all these things now. It's just always something that's part of the dialogue, just like it's all, always part of the dialogue to talk about um, bullying and race and social justice and all these things that are related to compassion and empathy and um, just being growing good humans. 
All right, we're gonna, we have one last question and then we can sign off. I wanna be protective of your time and everyone else's. So the last question, how should we respond when our girls start to talk about crushes? So this would be first and second grade little girls. So I think it's important not to sort of layer on adult feelings onto young children's expressions of these things. And so sometimes parents get really into this and they'll tease their kid and they'll be like, oh, you know, Sarah has a boyfriend. Tell everybody about your boyfriend. Um, you know, kids have crushes on opposite sex people and kids have crushes on same sex people. And it's just emerging sort of emotional attachment outside of parents. Real actual crushes don't really occur. When I say real crushes, I mean real true romantic feelings that are linked to sort of sexual urges don't start occurring until later. So first and second grade, it's more this understanding that people are developing strong attachments to people who aren't their parents or their siblings or their family members, because that's, that's normal, right? Um, so to sexualize it or to make it more than what it is at that age, and again, I'm not saying that you're, you've been wrong if you've done that. We all sort of do that. Um, but it adds that, that adult layer on it that's not necessarily there. The important thing is to sort of validate feelings of, of whatever relationships, because we see a lot of kids get really hurt. And again, I studied social aggression for years. So we saw a lot of kids get really hurt by, by friendship, jealousy, and peer rejection, just as much as they would romantic feelings. And so to sort of validate that all of those feelings hurt and that they all are part of feeling connected and also rejected and helping them manage those feelings across the lifespan. Because even though they don't have the sexual component to it or the romantic component, it still hurts or it still feels really good when you care about someone and they care about you too. So again, just sort of embed the values along the way. Um, Jill, I know we're running out of time. I wanted to share my email. Um, I'm always happy to talk to people about individual things. I also want to share that the Center for Children and Families is, you know, how we got connected and they have great resources as well. Um, and so I will share that information with you for, for, for those resources. So I'm always happy to talk to people um, if they've got any specific concerns and would like a referral. My email address is J, my first name. My last name is G-E-N-T-S-C-H at utdallas.edu. Feel free to put in the subject line that you met me here, met me here. Um, and again, it may take me a couple of days to get back to you, um, but I'm always happy to, to talk to parents about this. It's a real passion. And um, I think that there's a lot that we worry about and, and sometimes it just helps to, to have your mindset at ease as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Gensch. You were more than worth the year long wait. So <laughs> we really appreciate you. And I wanna thank everyone that spent the morning with us. So we will try to have this up on the portal um, by the end of this week. And, and I'll pop and in, when I, share, when I share the slides, I'll pop in my email on that first slide so that you know how to reach me too. Wonderful, that would be perfect. All right. Well, thank you all for having me and I hope you all have a wonderful day and um, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.